Welcome back to Med Twitter this week. I've got a great guest for you. I have Dr. Chuma Obiname, and he had a fantastic tweet, but also some other interesting things that he did this last week that I'm going to introduce to you guys. Um, but I'll talk to you guys after the intro. Welcome back. Now, before I talk to you about Dr. Obenemay's tweet, I'm going to introduce him. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure being here. Now, what, now what I find interesting about how I came about following you was this, this whole thing called Share the, Med, uh, Share the Mic Now Med. Right. Uh, do, you, do you mind explaining to me a little bit behind, behind that and how you got involved with this? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was honestly kind of serendipity. Um, so I'll just give you, I guess, the full story and you can edit out whatever stuff you want to. OK, but no editing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as soon as COVID hit, um, we at uh, at Emory, we basically created this writing collective called Narrative Medicine, sort of for, you know, residents to sort of talk about the experiences they were having in the hospital. Um, and of course, the person behind that was Dr. Manning, because that's just so on brand for her. Yeah. And it was, and so I just, we started writing. Um, there was a, a actually, she's going to be a third year now, Lakshmi. She's on Twitter too. But um, she started this, we just started writing and giving her, you know, pieces that we were doing. And then because we had, we had gotten to like, you know, a good 12, 15 people showing up every week, uh, Dr. Manning had the idea of why don't we bring Dr. Syed Tabatabai, i.e., at the real Dr. T on. So he would come and like give us some of his stories. And so he gave us a story and it was really good. And, you know, I just, I messaged him one day and was like, just asking about stories, his writing process, you know, how do you come up with all these quotes? He actually has, you know, I'm going to out him a little bit. He's got, he's got like a whole bookshelf of quote books, like books that just have quotes. Well, he's been, um, he's been doing a lot of quotes recently. I've noticed. I know. Yeah. The, like the, uh, I think it's a Nathaniel Hawthorne. He had one that was really good. Um, yeah. So we, so then, then he sort of tapped me once this came up. I, I didn't even know anything about it. He was, he just sort of came to me and said, okay, you know, we are doing this event called hashtag share the mic now med. Would you like to take over my Twitter account for it? And initially I was like, no way. I'm not touching this thing. I just, you know, started getting serious on Twitter maybe like a few weeks ago. I don't think, you know, I had that like the intense imposter syndrome hit me super hard um and he was just like you know there's nobody else he's like it just kind of makes sense for you to do it because you know you want to tell stories and you have been and i already tell stories so who else would you know take over for me um and so you know after like a few days of sort of mulling it over i said okay let's do it um and so you know i tried to just put together some threads to sort of take people through a journey of you know, why I, I want to tell stories that are medicine related, uh, the story of COVID that's happening now, uh, and then how that sort of mixes in with health disparities. And then I think the last one I put was, I tried to time it for 8.46 uh, PM, just to highlight that that was, you know, I, I think I, I asked how long did it take, you know, um, just to sort of bring people's minds back to the fact that, you know, George Floyd passed away and, and now we're, you know, really, trying to figure out how residencies can create structures that would upend, you know, systemic racism. So I think that's, that was sort of my, my plan with it. And I, I really, I, I, I followed you that day, you know, as soon as, I, you know, when, when the real Dr. T said, I'm having this, this gentleman, this doctor take over my, take over my hashtag. I knew this was serious because he would not just let that to anyone. So, right. you know, I followed you from that day on and, then when you took over, it was fantastic. And, and honestly, the whole hashtag, I've been following since, I believe, the week before. Okay. Because we had, they had been doing this with a, a bunch of, of, of women, correct? Right. Yes, yes. So, they definitely led the way. Trailblazers. <laughs> so it was, it was just the last two weeks have been amazing to follow that hashtag. So I really encourage people to go back and take a look, follow up through some of those threads because I yeah. really enjoyed it. So. In terms of storytelling, like, so you have other forays in which you're, you've been doing your storytelling as well. Is that right? That, that is true. Yes, yes. So it's funny, you know, 
the first story that I wrote, uh, it was the one I put on his, um, his feed, which is when did coronavirus become real? Um, I liked it, but at the same time, I don't know what it was. I was just hanging out with my fiance and I was like, why don't I just put this to music? You know, I'm like, I feel like there is a soundtrack to these words. Um, and so I did. And then we, I basically sent it to Lakshmi and she had to like, it was really funny. She had no idea what to do with it. Cause she had just been getting, you know, word documents. She's like, what do I do with this MP3 file? So she set up this SoundCloud. Um, and then we started just, I just started, th- I actually, you know, Dr. Dr. Tabatabai, he heard one of them. It was my second. And then I just, after that, I just had so many stories that were coming. I just decided to make a podcast called, you know, the silent doc, uh, where we basically, I kind of tell stories. A lot of them are stories a little bit. They're a little bit more sometimes it's like analysis. Some days I'm feeling like satire. You know, I have one that's like the COVID rules, mm-hmm. which is sort of this like, you know, what is, what would the outside hospital, how's the outside hospital responding to COVID? You know, if people are just not wearing masks or, you know, just sort of running amok in the hospital, how would they respond to it? Now you're the silent doc. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not, I, I am the silent doc. Okay, I'll just, it's like the Spider-Man moment or no, the <laughs> Iron Man moment. I am Iron Man. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I do most of that there. Excellent. I mean, I, I really, so I've only, actually a bunch of those, you're, they're really nice, short, succinct stories. I think I be, even between two and six minutes, only the most recent episode that you ha- had was even broke like the, the, the double digit, uh, yeah. I believe. So, and that's, that was the point, you know, I really do just want to, I think there's so there's so many podcasts that are really, really good that I didn't want to bog people down with being like, oh, if I want to get to, you know, the content, it's going to take like 30 minutes to get to a good point. It's like, I just want to get you like a really, a cool sounding story in like five to 10 minutes. And that's actually, this is just a small side. I don't know if you know about Beast Mode that we have at Emory. I've definitely heard about it. Absolutely. So bite-sized teaching. So, you know, that was almost even the way, and that was, you know, a creation of Dr. Manning. Um, and that's how I kind of approach all my stories that a good story can be told in about eight minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, if I get really creative, okay, I, I can push it to 12, but I don't want to keep you on there too long. Um, and I just hope that it's impactful. Nice, nice. So narrative medicine beast mode. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. That's it. So I, I do want to get to your tweet because oh, I absolutely. think it, it goes in well with sort of the themes that I've had recently where I've had, you know, I've had residents on talking about um, what's like as uh, what what you should be looking at as as you're getting ready to apply for residency. Mm -hmm. Um, I've recently had people looking at physical exam skills, but then also uh, discussions about how to what you can do as an attending to be a better attending. And so your your tweet sort of goes into this. So I'm going to read this to people. So ooh, med Twitter, hashtag med Twitter, wanted to revisit lessons for hashtag COVID seniors for our rising PGY twos. This was tweeted under the real Dr. T via share the med mic now, share the mic now med, <laughs> an event to amplify black voices. Hope to do a recap soon, which I, I don't think I've seen the recap yet, right? I, I'm, I'm keeping it in hiding right now. It's going to be good. It'll be good. Okay. So, so one thing she, you talked about was, um, actually, you had watched our episode last week with Dr. Kittleson, correct? Right. right. So do you want to, so you, you're talking about how your m- mind has been changed recently on this topic. <laughs> do you want to, do you want to explain what you were talking about? Okay. So I'll, I'll tell you the, um, the, so basically I've been just reading a lot on Twitter. It's a fascinating place. Uh, and, you know, some of the lingo, I guess people should go back and read the first nine rules, but I introduced the idea of COVID seniors. And what is that? It's a, it's a senior that was really born while COVID was in full of peak, you know, because every time they see a cough, shortness of breath, even diarrhea now, you have to consider coronavirus. And that was not the case when I was an intern. Um, right, right. And so, you know, I, the last one, the last rule I decided not to put on his page because my fiance was like, you can't write that on someone else's page. You know, that's, that's too controversial. And I was like, okay, um, I'll put it on mine. So basically the rule is manage the attending. Um, and I felt pretty strongly about it until I listened to Dr. Kittleson. Um, and then it sort of made me think that this, this interaction we have with our attendings is more complex than I think I'm making it out to be. You know, when I first wrote it, and it's not to say that all attendings need to be managed. I think, honestly, most probably don't, but you do have that attending or you run into those situations where, you know, 
it's the second day in a row that you've only rounded on half the patients and it's 1145 with conference at 12 or 1230. And then you're rushing through the last ones. Um, right, right. Or, you know, the times where you, you spend a little bit too much time like bedside rounding or, or just little things that happen. Um, and I think when I first read the rule, I was like, you know, it's the resident's job to manage the attending. But then just like in my, I think one of my other rules was reflect daily, you know, do the root cause analysis on yourself. Um, and hearing Dr. Kittleson sort of go into her, the reasons why she asked her residents specific questions. Um, and then if they're not able to answer those questions, what does that say about how well a team or the resident is functioning within that team? Um, sort of makes me, it made me pause a little bit and say, okay, you know, maybe there's a reason why, you know, you were, were consistently late. That's not all the attendings fault, you know? Um, and so I think there is that interesting interplay between attendings and a rising, especially a PGY2, right? Who's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sort of coming into themselves, doesn't, is used to just following orders as opposed to, you know, kind of saying, hey, you know, I know what the institution's, what we usually do here. I kind of read this paper that just came out. I feel like we should be doing it X way. Um, and I think that's a delicate, you know, the way to challenge your attending in a respectful way is something that took me a really long time to do. And I think I'm going to have to relearn how to challenge my attending as a fellow, um, given that what I can't even scope yet. How do you, how do you tell your attending, Oh, I disagree with your management. It's like, you just got here. What are you doing? So I think it's, it's, it's delicate. Well, also, you know, and people may not know this, but you're, you're going to be a GI fellow very, very soon. (laughs) <laughs> and honestly, you're as a fellow, you're actually sort of in this in between because to degree you've gone through residency, you're mm-hmm. you are at the level of many junior attendings, um, maybe not in just maybe not in the GI, but for many other reasons in terms of management. So when you when you say manage the attending, I think it comes from a, a place of good of where Dr. Kittison is talking about is this resident the captain of the ship? Are they are they right. being the captain or are they being are a they waiter? Being led? Right. So, right. and, and, and I think every attending would, um, or at least hopefully most attendings really appreciate when their, their residents, their senior residents want to be the captain, they want to run the ship. Um, I, I do think where, where it comes in is, you know, because you, you haven't yet had the experience as the attending, right. understanding the, um, it is a two-way street. And I completely agree. I really do think that seniors need to talk to their attendings. What's working right? What's not working well, mm-hmm. right on rounds? I mean, so very recently I was just on inpatient service and, you know, the time before it was super easy because it was just me and a senior that we had gotten rid of all the interns. They, <laughs> we, we shipped them off to the ICU. There are right. no students. But then when I came to service this time, now all of a sudden I have like two, I have two students. I have, uh, you know, I have an intern, I have a senior and I have a very large team now I'm trying to try to figure out. And then we're also trying to reduce like patient, patient, uh, uh, well, team to patient contact, you know, mm-hmm. to bare minimum mm-hmm. in order to save PPE. So, you know, we were rounding in ways which I was not used to rounding. And right. so, and honestly, this happens every time on service just because right. the makeup is different. The senior is different. The intern mm-hmm. is different. They have different strengths. They have different weaknesses. You know, so every time on common service, there is like a trial period of what works best. Do we, I personally love to bedside round every single patient. This is right. me. And most of the times, depending depending on the service, I can do it all very quickly in the morning. Now, depending on, now, now there's added complexity to our service, you know, in terms of how fast things can happen, who mm-hmm. can actually go see the patients and so forth. And who gets it was just taking long. Heart. So uh, it was like, yeah. okay, well, we're going to do some table rounds here, some bedside rounds here, but then like deciding who was, you know, that was just something that happened over the next, the two weeks that I was on service was trying to figure uh-huh. out the right, but I feel by the time we made it to the end with a close dialogue with my seniors and mm-hmm. my intern and the students, every single day is what worked well today, what didn't work well today. And mm-hmm. I, and I do feel that what one hopes that the attending is doing this. So the resident doesn't feel like they have to manage the attending, <laughs> but I completely agree. It's, it's a two way street because right. we all have yeah. our own priorities. So yes. that's why this really spoke out to me, this tweet. And I'm, and it's not often you actually get to hear, you know, the other thing about social media is rarely do you hear people talk about how their mind has changed because of what they've seen or read on social media. Mm. So many of us are just ingrained in like, 
this is what I think I'm not willing to learn more. But I think this is where I love med Twitter is I think there people tend to be more open and there's a dialogue except for, you know, very obvious things like, you know, anti-vaxxers or anti-maskers and stuff like that. <laughs> right, but other yeah. than that, I think most of us are very open to the dialogue and the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what, I think that's the best thing about med Twitter is that you think one thing and then, you know, even, you know, today, I think I sent you that little quick article about like um, it looked at how time factors into some like decision fatigue right. and how, you know, the longer you spend trying to make a decision, either at the end of that decision, you're going to be so fatigued and you might make, <laughs> might make a mistake there, or you won't have enough time to make the decisions that you need to for the, like the last two or three patients on your service. And you're just like, okay, okay, quick, 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 quick. And the interns rushed, you don't get this data. And then, you know, you look back a day later and you're like, why did we, <laughs> why did we give that dose of right. like, It doesn't make sense. <laughs> oh, I agree. I, I mean, I think, I mean, we, you see this decision fatigue happen outpatient settings all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there have been studies that show that as the day progresses, the physician, the primary care, facet, primary care setting will actually, re, will, will do less screening, will, less, will order less colonoscopies, right, less mammograms right, and exactly, things like that. Exactly, exactly. Because we get tired, we're all human, we get tired. So definitely when you're rounding, you don't want to be rounding late. You want to be if good and efficient. Uh, but, you know, we all have our own priorities too. You know, the, we're, are we trying to teach or are we trying to get things done? You know, the senior mind says, I need to get the patient seen because I need to write those notes so I can get all those orders in and get all my consultants. That's Where the right. tenant's like, I need to do all that, but I need to teach my senior, my mm -hmm. intern, and my students, you know, How and then do that? also depending yeah. on their comfort. Like if they yeah. don't, if, if they don't only just met the senior, they don't know how much they need to micromanage or not, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It was nice. My last, my last wards month, I got to do it with the same attending I had my first month of wards oh, as an intern. And so it was great getting back with that attending just because we already knew each other. And, you know, there were so many things that were just, there's so, it's so easy to sort of communicate with somebody who you've already spent, you know, a tough two weeks with. And so she already knew, she knew so much before I even had to say it, like based upon my face, you know, so it was, it was really great working with her. But I bet you the feedback was also amazing because she's been able to see you like grow throughout all this time as well. Yeah. 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 No, that was, it was, it was, I mean, it, the feedback was sort of us just chatting about, you know, life and like how she's, you know, just doing different things with her life and her kids and stuff. So that was, was actually fun. Oh, those are the best type of feedback. I mean, I, I, feedback is a conversation. I don't yeah. ever feel yeah. it should be one way anyway. So it, it should be just a dialogue between, you know, the feedback and the feedback E because I think both are giving feedback at the same time. So that's really, right. really cool. That's also another one of my roles, give effective feedback. And, you know, I, there, there are so many, so many things I, you know, I've, I've read about how to give effective feedback. We can definitely, we should probably bring you back on sometime just to talk <laughs> about effective feedback. I know I we'll, mean, we'll, we'll bring you back halfway through your fellowship. And then you can talk about what type of feedback you have given, like to your, your residents, to your students, what feedback you've gotten from your attendings. And we can learn from that. I think. That would be awesome. I have to say that anything I know about feedback is from Jen Spicer and Dr. Really, I think Varun Fadke, who really helped like energize our, our teaching curriculum at Emory. So I, I would not say that I know anything more than them because they taught me everything about setting the learning like climate and, you know, being approachable and, and all this stuff. So, you know, they're the experts. I'll say that. <clears throat> fantastic. Fantastic. All right. So I'm going to go through quickly some of our favorite tweets of the week. So first, actually, I'm going to go through some of the tweets that um, that. Dr. Travis Smith has, has been able to give us through med tutorials. And these are the five top ones they had in no particular order. Um, so the first would, would be from Ferdas Rahman, which is a, a great tutorial about arthritis and how it's not really synonymous with arthralgia. They go through a couple of differentials. Really great thread, I loved it. Um, next is another one of my favorites and probably I've talked about Avi multiple times in several episodes is Avi Cooper. He had a great 15 thread tweet on alpha one antitrypsin. Uh, deficiency and the cause of liver disease. Um, I'm sure Avi is going to talk about this in a, in a future episode of The Curious Clinicians because I just assume they all will be. So if you miss it, miss the tweet, you can definitely make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Um, one from Rich Davis talking about um, how, how do masks work, how they block respiratory droplets. I think it was, it's, that's a great one to, to, to read and possibly to share to some of your people, some of your friends and family who 
don't have some good understandings about mass because there seems to be a lot of debate about this. Um, and um, the next one is from my alma mater, but from the infectious disease department, IU um, ID had a, a ID border view case by a 25 year old with a recent tattoo and now with non pyritic non tender rash. I won't spoil that for you, but I'll make sure make, you guys should make sure you go through that. And from Najam Seek, um, they had a great tutorial about do citizens of third world countries have better resistance to COVID-19? I'm not going to spoil that for you, but I really, really encourage you guys to check that one out. So those were the top five from med tutorials. Um, for my own personal list, um, one of my favorites was from Uchu Blackstock, who had a discussion about how science has always been political. You know, there have best, definitely been discussions where people are like, why are you trying to make science political? And her discussion is, actually, science has always been political, especially for, for Blacks in the country. So you should really check that out. It's fantastic. Um, of course, I can't, can't go through another week up without talk, talk, talking about Dr. Kimberly Manning. She also had a wonderful, wonderful um, thread. Um, Dr. Dr. Bob Centaur, Uncle Bob, as we call him over on the Curbsiders, <laughs> He had a five good minutes tutorial on FINA. I know there are a lot of discussions about this, um, but I think Uncle Bob has some, good, has some really good points about FINA in, the, um, in use in the inpatient setting. And let's see. And lastly, I really want to bring up this tutorial from The Scope. I don't know if anyone um, subscribes to The Scope, but it's a fantastic newsletter. They also have a great Twitter presence. Um, their newsletter comes out every every week. It was originally de um, designed, uh, written, and by a bunch of these residents. But now they have gone on to their own fellowships and and attending ships or whatnot. Um, but their their weekly newsletter really talks about um, the, the the newest medical issues of of the week, articles, journals. But they also bring it talk about it in a very um, very fun way. So their newsletters are really fun. I really encourage you to subscribe. But this, this thread that they have is why does every BMP sh report a show a GFR for, for non-African-Americans and African-Americans? Um, and even though they have the same creatinine value and they really talk about the, this ratio of adjustment and is it actually founded on good evidence and uh, TLDR, it's not. So, in fact, many organizations have stopped reporting an Afri African American adjusted GFR. Um, so, I really, really encourage you guys. It's 17 tweets long, so very short, but I really encourage people to check that out. So, those are my favorite tweets of the week. Do you have anything that that you that you you enjoyed? Any of the tweets that maybe I mentioned? Do you want to talk about or other ones that you have thought about? I mean, I think the only one. I mean, there. I feel like I I just. I just scour, I eat this stuff up. Um, I really liked Dr. Manning's one. I mean, not to bring her up again, she's amazing. Um, I think the one that she has about how to make, I guess, the new interns feel welcome by just asking their name, how to say it, what name do they want to be called, what name do they not want to be called. That last one is actually, you know, one of the interns uh on my team or i should say cits um on my team he his the name that's actually on his badge is the one that he doesn't want you to call him and he has really? a nickname that he goes by and the name on his badge like if you call him that you're already sort of you're already in his bad graces you know oh yeah and yeah. so it's just a, it's a really it's an easy thing to do and it helped me a lot because i you know from day one you know, I saw that he had, you know, I guess in his name, he just had the apostrophe, Dustin. And um, I was like, which one do you go by? You know, he's like, I go by Dustin. I'm like, okay, good. Perfect. Cool. Um, so I really like that. No, I mean, literally at the time of recording of this, uh, this tweet's literally like an hour old, but I really I encourage people to check this one out. Um, yeah. She is, Dr. Manning, Dr. Kimberly Manning is just probably <laughs> one of the most... I don't even know what to say. She's just so amazing. <laughs> right. So maybe that's, I mean, I will, I mean, she definitely doesn't need any more amplification. She does, <laughs> definitely does that well on her own, but I, I will, I will sing her praises up until the end of the world. So absolutely. I'm in that, I'm in that club as well. <laughs> so do you have anything else you want to talk about? Anything you want to say, any, any future things that, that's going on or I mean, I'm definitely mm -hmm. going to encourage people to check out your podcast. I know things may slow down as fellowship starts, but I'm sure once it's, the juices start going, you, you've got yeah. plenty of stories to tell. I mean, I think, 
you know, I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of different things about where the podcast could be going. Um, you know, I did the last, the last one I actually recorded was the, at an interview with, uh, Beardry Rao, who's a, he's going to be, he's a rising, he's, he's about to start his cardiology fellowship. He's doing like a research track here, um, here and he, but he also did economics, I think at Northwestern. Um, so he has these, he has like lots of interest in, you know, how to just like how to help patients, I guess, move through their hospitalization. Um, but we talked about a lot of different things. So I think I, I'm probably wanting to move us the podcast more in like the interview format. Like there's a lot of different voices that I actually want to get into. Um, with some of the residents who are here who had really, really interesting experiences with COVID, whether it's like, you know, because they had family who was, you know, from Wuhan or Mm -hmm. they, you know, going to the ICU and all the changes that were occurring on a daily basis. I don't think people really have an idea of what it is when, you know, your institution is literally changing what you do every few days and how that can sort of rock the way that you practice. And um, so I think, I think those are stories that probably need to be told as well. Oh yeah. And I'm totally there for it. I don't know if people have been, been following like the nocturnists, but they have just right. been destroying it with like this story after story. And they're all, they're all stories that need to be heard. So, and you know, what's you know, what's coming in the nocturnist. Yes, I know. Yes. Yes. So uh, <laughs> we'll probably end up featuring that in the future. <laughs> so yeah. excellent. Excellent. So I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for spending just a little small segment of your time before you, as you're getting ready for your fellowship to talk to me. Hey, I really appreciate it. I, you know, it's funny. I've been, even when I wasn't active on Twitter, I was, I was always kind of following you and I I love Ohio State University um, or I should say the Ohio State University. Um, So it's just a pleasure coming on here. Fantastic. All right, folks. Thank you again for following MedTwit this week. I want to make sure that you know that we're on multiple platforms, Apple and Google Podcasts, YouTube, Periscope, Twitter, um, pretty much everything. I don't have an Instagram yet. I'll have to find someone who wants to do Instagram for me, but I'll get to that. Um, But thanks again. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Um. One thing I forgot to ask, I meant to ask at the beginning, was you said former fencer. And I want to know oh. what blade do you fence? Because I'm an oh. atheist. Oh, yeah, me too. Oh, you, you must be tall. Yeah, yeah. No, I do have. <laughs> I very, I've, so I picked it up late. You know what's funny?